depression, St. John Paul II once said, is always a spiritual trial. Join us today as we talk about understanding and overcoming the trial of depression with our special guest, psychiatrist Dr. Aaron Cariotti, author of The Catholic Guide to Depression, How the Saints, the Sacraments, and Psychiatry Can Help You Break Its Grip and Find Happiness Again. I'm Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. Today we'll be talking about the topic of depression. I'm your host, Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. I'm joined here in our studios with our regular panelist, Dr. Regis Martin, Professor of Systematic Theology here at Franciscan University. Uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, who holds the chair in the Father Michael Scanlon Chair in Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization, and Dr. Aaron Kiriati, uh, who is the uh, Associate Professor of Psychiatry and the Director of the Program in Medical Ethics at the University of uh, California, Irvine. Uh, you are uh, the Chairman of the Clinical Ethics Committee at the uh, University of California at Irvine Medical Center, and you're a graduate from no both Notre Dame and got your uh, medical degree at uh, Georgetown. Your, uh, you and your wife have five children and live out in California. And today we're talking about the book that you wrote, uh, The Catholic Guide to Depression, How the Saints, the Sacraments, and Psychiatry Can Help You Break Its Grip and Find Happiness Again. So welcome to the program. It's great Thank to have you. you. Michael. It's yeah. great to be yeah. here. Yeah. Well, if we could start off, where our topic is depression. So maybe we could start there. What, what is depression? Well, depression is a disorder of mind and body that can profoundly impair a person's ability to function both mentally and physically. And a lot of folks who haven't experienced an episode of clinical depression assume, gee, you know, I, I know what that must be like. You know, I've hit rough, rough patches in life. I've had bad days or times where I've uh, been down in the dumps. But when psychiatrists talk about clinical depression, we're talking about something that is pretty qualitatively different from what most people have experienced in the, in the usual ups and downs of life. It's not like just having the blues or just having a, a bad day. That's right. It's, it's also not just about our emotional state or our moods. Depression tends to disrupt, for example, a person's normal sleep-wake cycle. So they have severe sleep difficulties. It can change their appetite in ways that they can have profound weight loss, hmm. which can compromise them medically. It can lower their level of physical energy to the point where just getting out of bed in the morning is a major chore. Mm. It affects our thinking as well, our cognition. It can narrow our ability to think flexibly, to see the future with any sense of, of hope. Uh, it impairs a person's ability to enjoy activities that usually they would find pleasurable. So psychiatrists call this anhedonia. That's sort of the technical name for it. Mm. Uh, and depression often uh, leads a person who otherwise would never consider it to start thinking perhaps life is not worth living anymore, perhaps suicide might be an option for me. So we can see that depression is, is a state of really profound mental and physical suffering for an individual who's yeah, I, I think that's the, the theme that needs to be underscored. Uh, I was hoping that it would come up even sooner, this one item in the inventory, and that's pain. Mm. Uh, people who are depressed are in the grip of a profound and even unspeakable pain, yeah. excruciating sorrow. Yeah. I mean, you, you give the example of that woman in her 70s who recovered from cancer, right. and she said, the ordeal of cancer I would be willing to face again rather than a day of clinical depression. That's right. Interestingly enough, I was doing a radio show just a couple of weeks ago, and the host uh, told me during the show that he had, at one point in his life, lost his leg, and after that underwent a, uh, an episode of depression. And he said oh. the episode of depression caused him more pain and suffering mm -hmm. than the physical ordeal of, of the loss of one of his limbs. So I wow. think these two stories really illustrate yeah. the, 
the, the psychic, the psychological pain and the intensity of that pain right, that a right. person with depression. And, and the fact that people who it. aren't depressed can't really appreciate right. the That's, extent, the abyss of the pain that those who are afflicted must uh, endure. You know, that's why it's important for you to emphasize the fact that we're talking about clinical depression and not just sadness, not even deep sadness, because sure. it's different in kind, not just degree. It isn't just worse than what most people have, it's something different. And it's been in my family and in my life experience, I've known people who've gone through it. You know, and at one level, I suppose you'd think, well, you're a good Catholic, you know, you have prayer, you have recourse to the sacraments, you shouldn't be you know, depressed and that sort of attitude. And it's common, but I think what we have to recognize is that you know, sadness is not the same as clinical depression. But clinical depression is a near epidemic. I mean, it has really spread far and wide and deep for Americans and throughout the world, yeah. but I think also for Catholic Christians who are doubly shocked right. yeah. that they succumb to it or that yeah. they're prone to it. And I, and I think that's why your work has particular importance right now. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you, Scott. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's not just uh, religious people who sometimes labor under this misapprehension as if to say, look, okay, you're depressed. For God's sake, start praying and right. you'll get over it. But secular uh, people, I, I think, are under a similar uh, uh, misconception. They think, well, maybe you're not working hard enough. That's right. Uh, industry is the enemy of melancholy. So for heaven's sake, get a job. Yeah. Right. Stay Motivational busy. Motivational therapy. Is right. What you Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it doesn't work. That's right, Be depression is a very complex illness and what we often see in people trying to approach, how do I deal with this, is that they will look at it from only one perspective and they'll miss other aspects of the disorder. So they will prematurely or excessively spiritualize it. Right. If only yeah. I prayed more, read the Bible more, re received the sacraments more frequently, I would somehow be inoculated from this particular yeah. disorder or illness or form of suffering prayer and the sacraments in the spiritual life have an important role to play in helping a person recover from depression and perhaps reducing their risk of depression. But a faithful and dedicated spiritual life does not make a person immune right. from mm -hmm. depression. Neither does um, hard work or right. physical activity. Right. Right. All of these things have a role to play. They're a piece of the puzzle. But depression has causes on the biological level including uh, genetic predisposition. Some people are just hardwired mm -hmm. to respond to stress or certain yeah. life circumstances with a depressive reaction, whereas another person might have a different sort of response right. yeah. to the same circumstances. So we have to be able to attend to the medical and biological aspects of the illness as well. It's too simplistic, it's too reductionistic to say it's nothing but right. a chemical imbalance in the yeah. brain. Right. Certainly there are changes in brain chemistry and we know that medications and other things can help to yeah. right that imbalance. Right. I but, mean, it, it, but it, so can psychotherapy. Right. It, it's horrible so, enough right. when somebody has depression, but when you visit upon them a kind of guilt right. as if they're responsible for this, or even I mean, that's them unbearable. Themselves. Even sometimes themselves, you know, maybe. Right, you know, yes, what am I doing right. wrong? Right. People yeah. tend to suffer in silence, and yeah. the, uh, you know, there's perhaps no mention of them, and prayers of the faithful at mass because of the stigma of mental illness. You know, someone gets cancer, they're flooded with sympathy, they're flooded with right. external shows of support. Right. If someone is suffering from cancer, they may be suffering every bit as much, perhaps even more, yeah. uh, or uh, suffering from depression, they may be right. suffering even right. more than the individual yeah. with another m conventional medical illness and yet people don't know what to say to them. Right, or they right. say the wrong thing. Well, they, they look perfectly a, normal. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's but, right. From the outside, physically. it's right. hard to tell but why you, this person can't get up in the morning. You said right. something that I think we all know deep down and, and resonate to, and that is, you know, the pain of the body is real, but the pain of the soul isn't less. Right. It's much greater. You know, I remember thinking back to, well, I think back to what St. Thomas More wrote about the sadness of Christ and this mm -hmm. sorrow. And, you know, the, the agony of Jesus on the cross, I mean, the, the physical pain is indescribable, and yet the sorrows in his heart are much, much deeper. You know, and, and that is a sinless redeemer. I think what we have to recognize is that, you know, the pain that people go through is something that is really not only unspeakable, but at times humanly unbearable. And the best we can do, I think, is besides praying for them, is to step away from putting them on a guilt trip. I mean, yes. really have nothing to do with that, 
And then be open to whatever possibilities there are besides prayer and the sacraments, which are powerful, you know, a professional help. And it isn't some kind of admission of failure. Uh, it really is, I think, a, a divine remedy at times. And uh, we ought to be open to that sort of thing, even if it's humbling. That's right. It is an act of humility to say, uh, I'm dealing with something here that I can't fix That's right. on yeah. my own. And I'm willing to entrust myself to, to competent and honest professionals who yeah. may be able to give me some assistance. And, and for the person who's trying to help a loved one with depression, uh, to be willing to accompany them, to go there with them, not to reach in and fix, which we probably can't do, uh, but to have compassion in the literal sense of that term, to be willing to, to suffer with patiently and, and, and be present to the person, trying to understand them even though at times it may be hard. It, it really right? does require an imaginative leap of uh, what we might call the moral uh, imagination, to put yourself in somebody else's psyche, right. uh, to walk that extra mile. I remember years ago when I read uh, William Styron's Darkness Visible. I mean, the very title uh, suggests that this depression is palpable. It, 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 it's a presence, mm. uh, and it's everywhere, and it darkens and devastates one's life. The whole landscape is leveled, and you can't describe it. You can't somehow conceptualize or capture it in language. And others who have never been there, they can't relate. And of course, the, the title comes from Milton's yeah. description of, of of hell, or right. the emergence from a, yeah. from a hellish state. Yeah. And Styron complains at the beginning of that book about the word depression, yeah. mm. that it doesn't do justice right. to doesn't. the nature yeah. of this affliction. You know, yeah. depression is a sort of dip in the road or right. something mm. like this. Right. Uh, he prefers, and I prefer the older term melancholia, which suggests a sort of black and oppressive Right. mental state. Right. Yeah. Well, when we, we talked about this earlier a little bit, but do you think it's, a, it's more of a modern phenomenon? Because it appears as if there's right. more people suffering from depression today, or do we just simply recognize it? You know, it? I would say yes and no. On the one hand, we have, we have clinical de depictions and descriptions of depression going all the way back to, to Hippocrates in the fourth century BC, and even further in Egyptian medical literature that pretty accurately describe the, the clinical features of depression as we would recognize them today. At the same time, there's pretty good epidemiological evidence that rates of depression are on the rise, that there are social and cultural factors, yeah. social isolation, fragmentation of society, fragmentation of the family, that contribute in already vulnerable individuals to, to amplifying their risk for depression. My mm -hmm. colleague at uh, Duke, Dan Blazer, has written a book on the social origins of depression that, that mm -hmm. talks about this. So it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a new phenomenon, but it does seem to be getting worse yeah. in our time. In well, there is something about the modern age, uh, I, I think, that, uh, that aggravates uh, that, that condition. I mean, the Pope, uh, Pope John Paul II, when he addressed those psychiatrists uh, in Rome. He spoke about uh, consumerism and, and material prosperity and the distractions of, of, that, of that life, somehow accelerating uh, these tendencies that are, for the most part, latent in the human psyche. But they, they get exacerbated, inflamed by those very conditions that, that people so uncritically embrace. If I only have more, then I'm gonna be more. No, no, you're not. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you, we have depression coming from within and from without. Is, is that is that? Yeah, a, I think that's a good way to put it. We have to recognize both the endogenous factors and the external factors, yeah. the and social relations. You mean? I mean the, the stuff that we just simply come into the world with. Okay. You yeah. know, I, I have a strong family history of depression, let's say, and therefore I'm in a sense primed, okay. you know, to react yeah. to circumstances in a particular way. And initially, my first or second episode of depression might be tied up with the things going on in my life, you know, the, the loss of a loved one or losing my job at work or being under excessive stress. Over time, depression tends to beget more depression. Yeah. An episode of depression seems to change the brain in ways that it makes us more prone to relapse and to have future right. episodes. Right. Mm -hmm. So that with time and with repeated episodes of depression, the, the illness itself can seem to become more disconnected from external events right. in my life and, and kind of take yeah. on a life which, of Which is why just getting another job after unemployment isn't necessarily the cure. <laughs> exactly. You know, because right. even if there is a trigger cause that sends somebody into a bout of deep depression, 
it remains multi-causal. You know, and so the response, as you indicate, has to be at several de different levels, both naturally as well as supernaturally. That's right. I, I like to say that we need to take a both and approach right, right. to the treatment uh, of depression. Because uh, the causes come Because from, the causes come from all these yeah. different directions. Yeah, it, it, it's really a great pity that there's not just one cause. I mean, if it were simply genetic, then you pop a pill. Right. You know, when you get a headache, you take aspirin. There must be some biochemical uh, medicine that you can imbibe, and bingo, it's gone. But it doesn't work like that. That's right. Medicines have their place. Psychotherapy has its place. Yeah. But there are many other interventions, and I, I would argue you could say spiritual interventions or spiritual forms of help yeah. that are necessary for many people yeah. in the recovery process. Well, I, I want to pick up on this point in the next, epi uh, next section here. Um, stay with us on Franciscan University Presents as we talk about depression, and now we'll go into the next seg segment uh, about its connection to the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. <music> A depression, like every other illness or condition we have, has a mind, body, and spirit connection. The, the mind and the body is obvious, but sometimes people don't notice the spiritual connection. By that I mean we try to avoid harm, we try to avoid hurtful things that are happening in our lives and we're depressed, and so we turn to other behaviors. Very often those are addictive behaviors. Alcohol comes to mind, drug addiction, gambling, sexual addiction. So when a person is hurting from depression, they will turn to those things rather than deal with the depression. So a true healing or a true recovery from the depression must take into account also those patterns of sin that they may have started to engage in. And, and that should be dealt with as well. People recognize Franciscan University as being academically excellent and passionately Catholic. We have the unique opportunity through our faculty members, through our students, to proclaim that academic excellence by reaching out in many different ways. We also remain passionately Catholic in the way in which we are able to worship, the way in which we are able to uh, bring that love of Christ to others on a daily basis. It's important for us to be able to embrace both. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. Uh, we've been talking with author, professor, and psychiatrist, Dr. Aaron Cariotti. Um, Aaron, I, I, we've been talking about depression as a whole, and uh, I, I want to go in as a Catholic into the role that depression might play in, in, in sin, and how sin and depression may have any connection, or is there none? Well, we know that all forms of suffering disorder, illness, ultimately are traced back to original sin and the fall. Our, mm -hmm. our broken and wounded human nature is now prone to illness, disease, disability, and ultimately death. But I think it's not necessarily accurate to say that any one individual's particular episode of depression or uh, their experience of depression can be traced back to that particular individual's personal sins, okay. let's say. I think that's a mistake that a lot of folks make. You know, the Gospel of John recounts an episode where the disciples come up to Jesus and ask him, was it this man's sins or his parents' sins right, that caused him right. to be born blind? Yeah. And our Lord says, you know, I, you're asking the wrong question. He reframes right. yeah. the whole thing for them. So I think we don't want to fall into that simplistic trap of blaming the victim yes. for what it is that they're suffering from. Now certainly uh, the fact that we live in a sinful world our own sins and those of others can make us more prone to suffer from depression. Someone who has suffered uh, as the victim of early childhood abuse or neglect, for example, we know that that individual later in life is going to be more prone and more, more at risk yeah. for developing depression. So there is a relationship, but it's not a clean sort of one-to-one -one okay. and direct relationship. Right. Yeah, but, but, but sin uh, allowed pain and suffering to enter the world, and therefore depression is part of that in a, in a, in a Right, I mean, if, if the depressed person is undergoing a kind of descent into hell, then the ultimate origin of that is the fall. That's right. If, right. if we hadn't fallen from grace, nobody would be uh, uh, falling into hell. 
Uh, it, it, it seems to me that that implicit stigmatizing of, of the victim is what accounts for the sort of shyness and hesitancy a lot of us feel in talking about the mentally ill. We don't want to embarrass them, yeah. remind them of their sins. Yeah. And of course, the victims uh, feel a kind of shame and they don't want to talk about it. So there's a double silence which we need to break through. And it is extraordinary that Jesus does it in the New Testament, but mm. somehow the story didn't take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. We don't want to compound their suffering. I mean, a, a depressed person is already, because of the depression, experiencing excessive rumination yeah. and a sort of scrupulosity on overdrive, you know, beating yeah. themselves up over uh, perceived wrongs or perceived faults far in excess of any, anything right. objective that they've yeah. done. So that morbid introspection can lead to an even deeper self-paralysis, as it were. I think you're wise, though, in emphasizing the role of the spiritual because, you know, the human soul is a spiritual substance. And so much of modern psychology that's supposed to study the psyche denies the psyche in as much yeah. as the psyche is the soul. And there's this reductionistic and materialist approach to the person as nothing more than body processes. And yet there's also a tendency among Catholics to kind of go to the opposite end and to spiritualize this sort of thing. You know, yet the soul is the form of the body and mm -hmm. the soul is really so inseparably united to us as persons, you know. And, and so I think it's important to recognize that, you know, at a basic level, even before you get into a, a severe uh, depressive disorder, uh, praying for one another, you know, yeah. um, uh, laying hands on each other, uh, as we do at Franciscan and other parish communities. Uh, the sacraments, frequenting the sacraments, especially confession uh, with spiritual direction accompanying that, I think, if there's a, if there's a serious depression. But also being open to uh, prayers of deliverance, you know. I, I, I don't think this should be done recklessly or carelessly, but, you know, the, the church through the diocese, through the bishop and priests, you know, there are processes in place where counseling and, and medical treatment can be accompanied by the prayer and the sacraments and serious and professionally informed priestly guidance in these kinds of prayers yeah. of deliverance. And I, I think when we recognize how multi-causal it is, we should celebrate the fact that the church embraces, you know, a, a, a kind of multifaceted approach to uh, treatment. As That's well. right, Scott. I, I agree completely. Yeah. And a, a reductionistic approach that says, well, let's just look at the brain, ignores the fact that medical research now shows psychotherapy changes the brain. So certain right. forms of interpersonal relationships uh, have a, a sort of causal uh, effect yeah, yeah, on right. our biology. We know that prayer changes the brain. There was a recent study just published showing changes in the cerebral cortex among individuals who were religious or spiritual, however wow. it was defined in the study, and who belong to a religious community. And those changes mediated uh, the fact that these individuals were at lower risk for depression. So again, prayer, the sacraments, right. don't make us immune from these sort, sorts of problems of life, but they can be a, a very important yeah. piece of healing and recovery. And I'm glad that you mentioned the prayers of the church and the prayers of deliverance, because the devil always goes after our weaknesses. That's where he gets his foothold, whether it's a, where, whether it's a character defect or some you know, physical disability or some uh, you know, mental vulnerability. That's where he's going to get in there and tempt us. Right. The person right. with depression is going to be more likely to be tempted to despair and a sense of hopelessness. Right. You know, in the Old Testament, we have the, the example of Saul, you know, who was the king and he had been anointed and he had prophesied and yet you know, because of his relationship with David, because of his own insecurity and jealousy, and because of evil spirits. He goes into a kind of darkness with, with, with a murderous rage towards his son-in-law, you know, and that sort of thing, you know. And the music of David, you know, and the friendship of others can soothe, but sometimes not ultimately deliver, you know. And I also think of the man by the poolside of Bethsaida for 38 years, you know. Jesus comes alongside and says, do you want to be healed? What a dumb question, you know. <laughs> right. But at the same time, when you listen to his answer, I've been here for 38 years yeah. and every time, you know, he could have said, yes, please, go ahead. But you can also sense that's, you know, that he's wallowing, not just, not, not in the pool, but in his own self-pity. Yeah. And I think this is where friendship is so important too, where people will come alongside 
and, and be patient and maybe even enter into that dark cave and spend time with you, even if they don't have a magical wand to wave. Yeah, I, don't think, I don't think we can <laughs> emphasize this enough, that note of solidarity, that you suffer alongside uh, the depressed person. I, I think of that wonderful line from T.S. Eliot's uh, Four Quartets about the wounded surgeon who plies, plies the, the steel, steel that right. questions the distempered part. part. Beneath the bleeding hands, we feel the sharp, sharp compassion, compassion of the healer's yes. art. I mean, that's an exquisite combination of competency and compassion. He's a mm -hmm. technician. He knows. He, he's a surgeon. Uh, he can make the right incision, but at the same time, he suffers alongside. He too is wounded, broken. He can identify with this person's pain. That's right. What, what the man at, at the pool needed, he said, I have no, I have no one else to help me you right. know, into the pool. Right, That's right. precisely what he needed was a friend who was willing right. to be there with him. It is instructive that he doesn't despair, unlike Saul. I mean, doesn't he end a suicide? I mean, this guy is healed. I mean, it's a long wait. But, I mean, that's sort of a metaphor for the Christian life. It, it's a, a waiting, a waiting in hope, and hope is the language of prayer. Yeah, and it's, it's powerful thinking that as a Catholic psychiatrist, you come fully equipped uh, to, to help a person because, you know, Jung and Freud and Skinner, they, they break man down. They, they reduce him so far that they ignore all these other parts, the, the social part, the spiritual right. part, the physical part, as well as the kind of psychological uh, elements that play into a human person. So when we're talking about the spiritual life, what, what impact or what influence does it have, does depression specifically have when we look at the spiritual life or the moral life? Because, you know, that, that, that does influence us. It has an impact in our lives. It does. A person who's in the thick of a, an episode of depression will often find it very difficult to pray. Mm. They will feel perhaps that God has abandoned me or he is far away from me. So the sense of uh, his, his presence, the experience affectively or emotionally of any sort of spiritual consolation can be completely absent from their life. Uh, a sense of personal self-loathing and self-hatred can often come to characterize their pattern of thinking, which makes it very difficult for them to accept what it is that they're hearing in, this, in the scriptures mm. uh, about God's love for them. Well, how can he love me when I'm such a, a horrible, loathsome, worthless mm. kind of person? And it's precisely there, I think, that we need to, to intervene to restore the person's sense of their own dignity. Yes. Right now you're suffering tremendously, but there is hope for you. Yeah. There is always hope for you. And that it, anything we can do mm. spiritually to instill in the person a sense of that, that key theological virtue of hope is going to help them to yeah. get through that period and to recover. It's not necessarily going to take away their pain right. immediately. Sometimes I tell patients, I know what you're going through right now is horrifying. And I know that there's probably nothing I can say to you today that's going to lift all of that anguish and make you feel immediately better. But I can tell you that there is hope, that what you have is treatable, that I've dealt with many other patients that have gone through what you've gone through and they have recovered fully. And if you're patient and if you stick with the treatment program with time, I think you will find relief from the suffering. And just instilling that sense of hope can be the most powerful thing I do therapeutically. That's so important. I mean, even slowing down the downward slide right. mm. before it stops and gets reversed, you know, to think that there is hope, you know, because you're not only prone to feeling unlovable by God, but you also tend to think that you're not loved by God. Right. Mm. Why would he allow this, you know? So on the one hand, I don't deserve mercy and grace. On the other hand, if he did love me, why would I be here? Yeah. You know, and, and it's, it's mutually reinforcing. And I think hope is precisely that, what you call the key that unlocks it. But I think it's also the most, you know, it is the underrated of the three theological virtues. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know, and, and oftentimes, and quite unwittingly, uh, the victim has entered into the sufferings of Christ. Yeah. I mean, his cry from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That experience of abandonment is, is replicated by the depressed person. Mm -hmm. He feels that dereliction. Mm -hmm. Well, 
you're part of Jesus at this moment, whose own cries are much wider and deeper than you know. He somehow includes you in his own definitive uh, sense of loss. Be being wrapped in this, I mean, th that just makes me think, you know, are, are there saints who have been depressed? Uh, is, that, is that, you know, can you look back and see? And if so, who? <laughs> sure. Well, many scholars believe that St. Teresa of Lisieux, during her teenage years, mm -hmm. went through periods of what today would probably be characterized as a a clinical depression. There's uh, non-canonized but very well-known Catholics as well. I think of Gerard Manley Hopkins, yeah. the well-known mm. uh, poet who wrote some of the most beautiful verse in the English language, who undoubtedly went through periods of deep melancholic depression, which, which he wrote about, which comes through in his mm. writings, in mm. his journals, and in his poetry. I think also, of course, he wasn't a Catholic, but uh, a great man of very noble character, Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. who I, I think it's pretty clear and well established now uh, by biographers and scholars of his life that Lincoln suffered profound periods right, right. of dark, melancholic depression. Yeah. Winston Churchill <laughs> would oftentimes speak of the black dog mm -hmm. that would descend upon him. Well, it, it didn't keep him from beating Hitler in, in right. the Great War, but nevertheless, he experienced this, this melancholia, uh, and it's crippling. Yeah. And, and, and Hopkins certainly uh, was able to take that experience and transmute it uh, into unforgettable, imperishable art, the terrible sonnets. I mean, mm -hmm. they record these dark nights, these descents into a kind of hellish blackness. And, and the sense that, you know, I'm sending these letters to God and they come back unopened. I mean, that's a terrible cry of anguish. Yeah, yeah, that's powerful. I, I want us to pick up on this and look forward in the next segment to how can we overcome or how can we help others uh, looking at depression. Stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. One of the scripture verses that I often uh, mention to my clients, remind them of is Psalm 34, 19, which says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted saves those whose spirits are crushed. And it's really good for, for folks who are depressed to hear that because, uh, again, they often feel far away from God. Uh, but in fact, this is actually telling us that in fact they're very close to God. And, uh, or perhaps more correctly, God is very close to them. Uh, and that God is watching over them. And uh, so it just gives them great comfort that they're not really losing their faith typically. Uh, in fact, they're probably growing in their faith and the Lord is with them every step of the way through these very difficult times. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy and you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. Uh, this entire program springs forth from the very heart of Franciscan University here in Steubenville, Ohio. Um, the cameras and the equipment are being run by our, our students here at the university. It's being filmed right here in our communication arts studio here at Franciscan University. Our regular panelists and myself are all uh, here at Franciscan University. Uh, we've been talking today uh, with Aaron Kiriati uh, about uh, the, uh, the Catholic Guide to Depression uh, and the topic has been Fascinating. I know it affects a lot of people uh, in, in many different ways. You know, no, speaking of students, uh, you look like a student. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know whatever possessed you to enter into psychiatry, because I know psychiatrists and they all look like Sigmund Freud. <laughs> They're in their 70s and you look like maybe you're 18. Uh, well, I'm a little more than 18, yeah. Regis, but, but I will say psychi psychiatry sort of snuck up on oh. me. As an undergraduate, I studied philosophy at Notre Dame and I was thinking of going to graduate school in philosophy because I, I love the academic life and, and that particular discipline. But um, my, my fiance at that time, my current wife, encouraged me to consider medicine because it was oh. another thing I had been talking about doing as a way to both pursue my clinical interests and my interest in, in philosophy by way of medical ethics and so forth. So I ended up going to medical school and 
when I went to medical school, I think psychiatry was the last specialty on my mind. Um, During my third year there, I did, uh, early on, I did my required clerkship in psychiatry. I was on an inpatient locked psychiatric unit and just found the patients and their stories and their experiences completely fascinated. I was just taken with it and, and fell in love with, with the work. I was fortunate there to train with some really skilled and really excellent uh, physicians. And it became clear at that point that psychiatry was, was the right specialty for me. And I think it's been good for me. I think as an academic philosopher, I would have uh, perhaps not been quite as grounded in the tangible realities right. Right. of, right. of right. people's yeah. lives. So yeah. it, it's a nice balance for me to pursue yeah. both the medical ethics yeah. work and the philosophy so as from, well as the clinical from work. medical school, where did you go next then and why? So, a- after uh, medical school, I went to the University of California, Irvine to do my residency training. Okay. So that's four years of training in psychiatry yeah. after, yeah. after uh, med school. Yeah. Yeah. And stayed on there as a clinical faculty member when I finished. And I've been on faculty now. I think this is my seventh Well, year. how do you square all of that with the fact that you're still only 20? <laughs> <laughs> and you've written a book and you've and got five, five kids. Yeah. Well, five I, boys, mind you. <clears throat> uh, well, you know, I, I, I usually write my books late at night. I don't watch a lot of TV. And I, <laughs> I have a wonderful wife that uh, yeah. Yeah. Without, without whom I would not have gotten yeah. My, my shoes on my feet. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, jumping back to our topic today, we, we've talked about the, uh, the serious nature, the gravity of depression, the reality uh, of some of its, its real uh, serious symptoms, causes, and, and uh, we've talked about its role in the spiritual life and its influence uh, in, in, in us as a whole person. Um, I know my, my, uh, my wife has a, a sister who uh, has suffered from depression. And um, you know, first, if, if you could just share, because it's, it's something that many people live with others who are suffering, friends or family members who are suffering from depression, would you have any advice or, or what could they do? Because some, some people may be able to overcome depression, others might have to be living with it for a long time. What would you say to someone who lives with or is in close proximity to someone? Well, I would pray for patience and pray to the Holy Spirit for the gift of understanding and counsel. Mm -hmm. Don't assume that you know what the person is going through. Try to listen. Try to be present and listen. And think about the fact that even though their impairments or their disability may be hidden, in ways that, you know, if they had a broken leg, it's obvious why they can't go to work or why it's difficult to do some basic tasks. But, but understand that they're undergoing a really serious affliction and that they may need to be encouraged just to take small steps, mm-hmm. you know, like a small child, that getting out of bed in the morning and brushing their teeth may be an act of heroic fortitude. Yeah, yeah. Right? Sometimes uh, we have to accept that a full recovery from a mental illness like depression may not be possible. At the same time, we want to encourage the person without being overbearing, without being too pushy, encourage them to seek help wherever it might be found. And that may include medical help. It may include help from a psychotherapist. Ideally, it would include uh, spiritual direction. And as a psychiatrist, I always like to work closely Whenever my patient is is a Catholic or a person who is also obtaining spiritual direction from a priest or a competent layperson, I like to get their permission to speak with their spiritual director to make sure that we're understanding what it is that they're dealing with and and coordinating our care so that I'm looking at things on the medical or the psychological level. The spiritual director is attending to, to their spiritual life. And I think that coordination of care and help with uh, the other people in the person's life, their family members, their spiritual director, their friends that are trying to help them. That can be very, very useful. Have you found, we kind of touched on this earlier, have you found that some of the patients maybe that you've worked with, um, that it's hard for them to even admit it, to bring it out, uh, or is that uh, or is that easy? Have they come to that reality? It's difficult for them to admit it, but when they encounter a person who is understanding, who doesn't make assumptions or make judgments about what it is that they're going through, there's also a great sense of relief and a mm-hmm. sense that now I can unburden myself yeah. Yeah. and I'm not going to be unfairly stigmatized or misunderstood uh, or, or patted on the back in a sort of condescending way and say, well, you know, just buck up, you'll, you'll get through it. So if we can approach that person with a real sense of love and compassion and a willingness to listen, I think that alone, without having 
to reach in there and solve the problem for them, that alone can give them great solace and comfort. You know, I think that's an important point to emphasize because, you know, the gifts of understanding and counsel, you know, can instill hope. But I think we tend to approach hope as simply hoping for a cure, you know, mm -hmm. when in fact hope is what also empowers people to endure you know, not only physical illnesses that are incurable or at least not going to be cured anytime soon, but also these interior illnesses of the soul. And I think when we recognize that these can actually bring us closer to Christ or bring our loved ones closer to Christ, even if you're not feeling that proximity, right. yeah. nevertheless, you can harness this in holy ways. You know, you refer to Jesus, you know, and we've been coming back to this again in Hebrews 5, verses five through seven. You know, here he is praying with loud cries and tears. And this isn't theatrical. I mean, this is from the depth anguish. of his soul, yeah. an anguish that none of us have ever experienced. It's not a clinical depression, but in some ways his sorrow was far deeper, precisely because he could love in a pure and divine way in his sacred humanity. But you can see, you know, that he was heard by him who was able to save him from death. But he didn't save him from suffering and death. He, he, he saved him from despair, which is a deeper death. And I think that's what friendship does, and that's what counsel and encouragement can also offer people. And I think sometimes that's what we really need to offer, you know, prayer and fasting for loved ones, but also just coming alongside as you've emphasized. Yeah. You know, what I'm, one last point I wanna make that, you know, in the book of Hebrews and throughout the New Testament, the most frequently quoted Old Testament book is the Psalms. Right. And, you know, it's the only book of the whole Bible that the church is praying 24-7. Right. There are 150 psalms, but experts tell us that about 42% of them are psalms of complaint or psalms of lament. Yeah. And when you read the psalmists, their prayers are often coming from that same sort of anguish mm. that isn't a quick, you know, the prayer is not a quick fix. <clears throat> I mean, uh, why have you forsaken me? It's abandonment. It's desolation. It's not despair. There's still hope. But you know, the fact that you can unite that prayer to the prayer of Christ mm. you, you know, can tap grace and I think also bring grace to many of your loved ones even while you're going through this. Yeah, what, what makes the Psalms so endearing is the fact that they weren't written by Stoics. They were written <laughs> by absolutely heartfelt Hebrews. Uh, I mean, Jesus was not a Stoic. I mean, he wept over Jerusalem. He certainly wept copiously uh, when his friend Lazarus died. And, and before bringing him back, uh, he commiserates uh, with those who loved him uh, the most, his sisters. And, and that, I think, is a model of, of solidarity, of compassion, of just in a companionable way, journeying along with the one who suffers and just being present to them yeah. without making judgments, without uh, patronizing in a sort of pompous way saying, oh, I know what you're suffering. Let me explain it to you. Right. Are, just are, being present. And, and, and being friends or being family members, are, are there warning signs? Because, I mean, there is, a, there is a, you know, potentiality with some people who are suffering from depression to consider that um, suicide or, or, or that their life isn't worth living in that sense. Are there warning signs that people should even be attuned to or looking out for? Sure. Well, for some individuals, even, even faithful Catholics who would otherwise never consider suicide for moral and spiritual reasons, when they're in the thick of the suffering of depression, this may look like the only escape hatch, the only way out of something that currently feels mm -hmm. intolerable. Um, there's a myth out there for example, that young people, teenagers, they tend to joke about suicide, right? Well, no, that's not the case. If someone makes an off-the-cuff remark about maybe, you know, maybe I should just end everything, or maybe I just can't go on anymore, we should inquire about that. We should take that seriously. Yeah. We should not dismiss that as just sarcasm or, um, you know, exaggeration. When, when someone is at acute risk of suicide, sometimes we have to take uh, measures to make sure that they are safe. Mm -hmm. right? So in extreme circumstances, if we believe that the person may be in danger of acting out on suicidal thoughts or suicidal impulses, even having them involuntarily hospitalized for a mm -hmm. brief period of time to get them through that period in an environment that is safe is, is going to be necessary and pot potentially life-saving. Um, if someone is struggling with suicidal thoughts and we know that they're seeing a physician or a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist, uh, just calling that person and letting them know what we're observing, you know, what's going on. You know, the person is, is isolating. They seem to be, you know, uh, 
giving away things that they own. They see they're doing things that are unusual for them, and I'm a little concerned. Giving that information to the person who's responsible for their clinical care can be helpful. Yeah, don't panic, but don't uh, trivialize this sort of thing. That's right. Right, right. You know, without going into any details, I, we have six <laughs> kids, and on my mother's side, I mean, my wife's side, you know, there is no de depression. In my side of the family, it goes back generations. Uh, over a half a century ago, I had a family member who went through 10 years of darkness before taking his own life. Mm. And, uh, and so I was aware of this, and my father was too, and he fought it and showed us, uh, even as a, a non-religious person, what a heroic and difficult struggle it is. But I never imagined that it would be possible for, for teenage kids, young teens, to have an adult-sized depression. Okay. Uh, and without naming names, you know, out of our six kids, a couple of times we've had to deal with that. And, uh, Boy, you know, on the one hand, my wife, who doesn't have any experience in her family, is just like, buck up, get over it, you know. On the other hand, I'm like, wait a second, listen carefully, you know. And it, it involved, for me, not only an educational experience, but, you know, reading and studying, talking to experts, but mostly spending a lot of time in a cave that I didn't even know existed. Mm. Hours, days, weeks, months. Thanks be to God, I mean, both of them are now in, 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 a, in a way that you could almost describe as divinely delivered. They look back and they recognize what, a, what a, a painfully difficult and a humanly impossible thing it was. But the prayer, the fasting, the sacraments, the friendship, the professional help, man, I tell you, you cannot underestimate the importance of this sort of thing. You know, and especially when you think there's no solution. Because while there might not be, Sometimes, and frequently enough, there is. And so that hope that you share through the endurance right. as parents, as spouses, because this is not just with kids, but spouses too. You know, I can't emphasize enough the importance of your contribution in the book as well as the wisdom you're sharing today. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got some things that, that need to happen, friendship, prayer, um, but really professional help. And in that professional help, is there a couple of quick things that you would mention as people go into that in, in, in the treatments? Well, some Catholics avoid seeking help because they insist on having a Catholic psychiatrist who shares their faith. Ideally, you could find someone like that. But uh, first of all, being a Catholic alone does not make one a competent psychiatrist. So better to see a competent Jewish psychiatrist than an incompetent Catholic psychiatrist. Find someone who is respectful of your religious beliefs and convictions and who is good at what they do mm. and be willing to take that step to get help. Excellent, excellent. Uh, stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. The main thing that I want to say to family and friends um, is really just a message of support and I really want to affirm the good work that family and friends do um, in providing a listening ear and being patient um, and sometimes helping with the day-to-day -day tasks that the loved one who has depression is uh, struggling to do, especially because sometimes the weight of depression becomes so heavy that it's hard to complete those tasks. And so to family and friends I would just affirm the support that you offer. It's a gift um, without measure and it provides hope to um, your loved one who has depression when they may question their own value or they may question their own dignity because of um, the burden of their illness. So I say to you, continue your good work. My name is Joseph Frelich. I'm a chemistry major, biology minor here at Franciscan University. I love the atmosphere. It's completely centered around the Catholic faith. When I play soccer, when I'm in classes, everything is, has that same Catholic attitude. Myself and a few other chemistry majors have the opportunity to work with top scientists in order to combat neglected diseases. I was able to connect my love for chemistry and also my love for mission work by synthesizing chemical compounds. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. Today we've been talking about the topic of depression. Uh, we've come to our final segment, so we'll have our, our kind of final points here. Regis, could you start us off? Yeah, uh, the, the commonplace uh, uh, observation uh, to talk about depression is depressing. But I think uh, we've given it a fairly lively and, and I hope 
uh, uh, helpful expression. And uh, I was really moved by what you were saying, Scott, at the end of that last segment, uh, recounting uh, the experience of depression in your own family. And it reminded me of, of a couple of things. Uh, in, in a beautiful uh, passage from Gabriel Marcel, he talks about the ontological mystery, which is the true prophetic tone of hope. He says, to pray or hope that someone I love will recover from even the most incurable of diseases means it is impossible that reality is not on my side, that in its most inward depths it has somehow struck this chord of solidarity with me, that all of heaven, all the angels and saints conspire to ensure that this person I love will somehow recover. I'm not alone. And then uh, the myth, uh, which I think, thanks to the coming of Christ, is actualized. The myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, I, I think, uh, really illustrates this. Uh, you know, he, he, nobody could sing as well as Orpheus, and on the day of his marriage with Eurydice, she dies. Uh, she's stung by a bee, and that's the end of the marriage. But he is inconsolable, and he, he insists on traveling into hell to rescue his bride. And he persuades Pluto, the god of the underworld, because he plays his flute so well that even Pluto, uh, his heart is melted. And he says, okay, you can go down and fetch her, provided that when the two of you emerge into the daylight, you don't look back. Well, he does look back to make certain that Eurydice is not far behind. At that instant, she falls again into hell. And he spends the rest of his life missing her, lamenting this loss. And he's utterly inconsolable. That, it seems to me, is the true nature of hope, that you're not resigned to see your loved ones lost forever, that you will endure that darkness, that you will somehow soldier on, because you're not alone. I mean, Christ is with us, and that presence, I, I think, is the ultimate consolation. Thank you, Regis. Scott. Well, we've talked about the whole gambit, you know, in terms of the sacraments, in terms of spiritual direction, in terms of prayer and the priestly ministry of the church, as well as friendship and solidarity and encouragement, counsel and understanding. You know, I, I can't help but also wonder if an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in this sense. You know, one of my favorite writers is Conrad Bars. And he talks about the importance of affirmation and this affirmation deprivation neurosis. When people are unaffirmed, they need to be healed. I think when they're unaffirmed, they, they're also more prone to such things as melancholia. Uh, I think as, as parents, but also in, in family relationships and in, in, in the church setting, uh, the need to find the good, not to pretend, not to make right. things up, you know, not, a, not to play hear no evil, see no evil, but you know, if there's anything good, if there's anything true, if there's anything excellent, worthy of praise, as Paul says in Philippians 4, think about these things and talk about them, and especially in families, you know, and especially workplaces, in a, and in the churches, you know, it's so easy just to focus on the negative. You know, and if God did that, we would not last. You know? And if, if God can find the positive in us and enlarge that, then we can certainly participate with him in doing that with our children especially, and adult children as well, as we have nine grandchildren now and a whole network of friends that really form uh, you know, a spiritual family. And I think the more I experience friendship from others who affirm what is good and who also give me fraternal correction, the more we really participate in the mission of Christ, the more we advance the new evangelization, but the more healing we can give to people even before the drastic measures become necessary. And I, and I think this dovetails nicely. I've already praised you and thank you for your work and for your book, and so I echo that again. But I also want to encourage our, our, our viewers just to really enter into the affirmation of the Word of God who loves us into wholeness and to share in that in just little ways every day. Mm. Oh, thank you, Scott. Doctor? Well, praise and affirmation is a spiritual good. We can never, <coughs> as parents, give too much of it That's to right. our children. Accurate affirmation, of That's course. Right. Um, what I would like to say uh, to those who are suffering from depression is that there is always hope. That though you may emotionally or subjectively feel the absence of God, Christ our Lord has gone with you. My soul is sorrowful 
even unto death. Mm -hmm. So while Jesus may not have experienced depression in the clinical sense of the term, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he endured not only our physical suffering and anguish, but our mental anguish as well. So he is there very, very close to you, even if you can't sense it, even if you can't feel it. And that, that spiritual reality has to be the basis for our hope, our divine filiation, the knowledge that by virtue of our baptism, which can't be eradicated, I am a child of God. God is my loving Father who is very, very close to me and who wants me to be close to Him and may allow suffering for a period of time, but ultimately He wants my good. Uh, for family members or friends that are trying to help a loved one and sometimes feel inept or, or powerless, what can I do? Remember that little things can be important. I've read many accounts where someone said, just, you know, my wife taking off my shoes and rubbing my feet and giving me that, that tangible contact with reality, that was the beginning of my recovery. Recall a story of a man who committed suicide, uh, tragically, by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. He was in his 30s. His psychiatrist went with the medical examiner to the man's apartment after his death where they found his diary. And there was an entry written in the diary just a couple of hours before his death, which said, I'm going to walk to the bridge, and if one person smiles at me along the way, I won't jump. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I, I use that as an example of, of this idea that I think we don't know all that we can be to another person. You know, no. St. Paul says to the Colossians, you have died in baptism, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And I think many times our acts of charity, our acts of love and kindness, you know, we have to sort of just deposit them with God and trust that they're doing some good in the world or they're doing some good for this person who I love who is suffering, even if I can't immediately see the tangible fruits of that, even if I can't, uh, you know, see the flowers that are, that are going to bloom in a distant field because of my prayers or because of my, uh, my fasting. And, and, and my efforts to, uh, to be a better Christian. So I would encourage all of those who are watching this to ask for and to try to build on the theological virtue of hope, which is so important in the life of, of a Christian. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much, Doctor. That, I don't think I could have summarized it any better. Thank you for being on the program. Um, if you've enjoyed today's topic, we have a handout for you. It's actually from uh, uh, Doctor's book here on the, uh, the Catholic Guide to Depression. Um, and it's uh, free to download at faithandreason.com or just for asking. Um, this entire program uh, springs from the heart of Franciscan University. And our mission is uh, forming the students who are transforming the world. And I wanna invite you to be a part of that mission. Uh, you can come in and join us at one of our summer conferences. Uh, you can join us on a pilgrimage to the holy shrines around the world. Maybe you wanna come and take, uh, get a degree, take some classes online or here on campus. Uh, maybe you can uh, just visit us at faithandreason.com. There's videos from uh, professors and speakers to grow in your faith and deepen your ability to serve in the new evangelization. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents, or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381, or call 740 283-6357.